continues to fire, but then during observation it also fires. We are actually imagining that in our own minds. So as you've probably seen these ski issues where you can go down a hill watching a videotape and you keep doing it in your mind and actually you turn out to be a better skier. We are chameleons. We actually manage to learn from each other. Look at this. Do you remember this fellow? He used to walk around in sweaters. He was a president, I think. Well, look what happens. This is his chief of staff. As the president moves, so does the chief of staff move. He creates the body which is identical to the posture of his dominant friend. The way this works then is that the cortex educates this fear center. It educates the amygdala and over a long period of time it changes the way in which you behave. That is why Chinese students who are acculturated in not giving up don't give up. It's learned behavior. It's much more fragile than the genetic side of things. So Smith, of course, was writing in the 18th century. This house was built a year after his actual book was published, The Wealth of Nations. They were closely knit communities and they were constrained, not only by the community itself, but by the way in which the climate and the territory confined people. People didn't leave their villages. They had to be together. That was the natural constraint on the market at that time. He couldn't foresee that the technology we live in now, the way in which the American business model, that wonderful thing which I'll show you in just a second, and the material affluence that we have experienced in this country, that completely changes the contingencies and changes the way in which we behave. Look at these people. They are not talking to each other. They're working with their technology. The cell phone, the... Uh, looks like a, it's probably a, um, a, a cell phone, perhaps, or something else, and a, 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 a laptop. So when you get to this point where you are reducing the amount of interaction, and at the same time, you increase the speed at which we can move around the world, you increase the speed at which we can move information around the world, you suddenly change the cultural contingencies. And on top of that, we have this mythology. We have a mythology that the free market must be free. Self-interest rules, no tax redistribution, stay out of the way of the market. Of course, the market is not free. We know that now. In fact, the amount of information that we have in our lives and the amount of commercial opportunity is such that we are addicting ourselves. Houses are much bigger, families are much smaller. They have 120, 1,260 varieties of shampoo on the... Now, that's every morning I thank God that my hair fell out because how do you guys make the decision? And of course we've invented other things. The credit card. Now you can get a credit card in which you have to pay nothing for a year, but once you start paying, you pay, if you default, 40%. This is an addictive culture that we have built for ourselves. And so, of course, now 70% of Americans do not pay off their credit cards every month and they are paying usury interest. It's an addiction. What you find in addiction is that the frontal lobes go to sleep. This is a normal person playing a card game. You can see that their frontal lobes actually work. In the addict, nothing works. They actually go to sleep and they do worse after their second trial than their first trial. We spend more money in America per capita than all other industrialized countries. How do we do that? Because we're not more productive. We're 24,000 against about 17. We're not more productive. We just work harder. We spend much more time supporting our stuff. And we save nothing. This is what everybody does who becomes addicted. This is the mythology, is it not, that we have to be care of the, take care of the addict because otherwise they'll take care of us by stealing things. We've invented this positive feedback loop which thus doesn't work. Anybody who's a physiologist knows that positive feedback loops do not work. They, in fact, they destroy themselves. So this self-interest, competition, and curiosity, which is the 
market driver, we have invented this fast new world, this commu uh, consumer opportunity, the manic response, which then through debt financing, we know a lot about that at the moment, and the technical innovation of whether it be uh, how to package financial instruments, how to package anything, this just generates this rapid cycle which eventually implodes and the victims are ourselves, especially in terms of sleep. So Smith's contingency then drops way back into this particular position where self-love is completely outranking social sentiment. And what you should also know is that America has become a less socially mobile society than has Europe. The correlation between a father's or parent's income in this country and a child is about 0.56. In Europe, it's about 0.23. And there are obvious reasons for that, but it, it, the, the fact that we believe we're the country of opportunity, it no longer is true. We are the world's greatest debtor. We have put ourselves into an extraordinary position. And as George Carlin says, it is called the American dream because you have to be asleep to believe in it. That is something which I think we are now worrying a lot about. But the good news is this. This is the good news because now we will stop and think and we'll get back to a period of scarcity perhaps when we will understand what it is that has happened to us and we will begin to use that creativity that you see in this wonderful conference to find our way out of this backwater. You see, we've learned that science and technology enable us to indulge our desires, but they do nothing to change them. And also, Commonwealth matters. Why do they call it the Commonwealth of Massachusetts or the Commonwealth of Virginia? It's because in those days, in the 18th century, we recognized that a common platform was necessary for the individual to be an individual. I have a few minutes left, maybe two or three. I'm going to ask you a few questions. How many of you live more than 1,000 miles from where you were born? Put your hands up. Look around. Over, it's probably 60% of the audience, maybe more. We are migrants in this country. That makes a big difference. And we are migrants internally. It breaks up the social networks. And it also has a genetic function, which I would, don't have time to tell you about. How many of you, when you are eating in a restaurant, keep your cell phone on? Most of you, again, huh? So when you, when you get that telephone call, you hang up on the person you're talking to, yes? It is, so the technology has begun to change the way in which we live. How many of you, just to pick one at random, drink more than four cups of coffee a day? Not so much there. That's good. That's good. Okay. And how many of you sleep less than seven hours a night? Uh, too many of you. See, this is what happens. This is all connected together. This whole thing is connected together. We can't just think about caffeine and fast food and reduced exercise. It's more complicated than that. Upstream is the sleep debt. Americans, on the average, deprive themselves of two hours of sleep every night. Sometimes they catch up at the weekends. So we are a nation not only in monetary debt, but in sleep debt. And this, of course, comes from a 60 to 80 hour work week. I won't ask how many hours people were putting in before they organized this conference, yes? Competition, time urgency, the fast new world. Do you know that in one of those big Starbucks coffees there is something like 800 milligrams of caffeine, which is about eight times the average cup? You could really drive yourself crazy with drinking that stuff. And the obesity is not the only thing. We've got anxiety and depression going through the roof, etc. Now, the interesting thing here, and I'm within just a few slides of finishing. <laughs> it's gone to 25 minutes. Do I have another 25 minutes? The, the, um, the fact is that this is connected together in a very physiological way. The studies show that if you sleep less, you weigh more. And this is because, in fact, there are two interesting hormones, one of which is leptin that suppresses appetite, which gets reduced during sleep deprivation, and ghrelin, which actually increases appetite. 
The neurosurgeon friend of mine at UCLA says he knows that because every time he comes home after a, after a night on call, in fact, he is ravenous for salt, fat, and all those good things that we didn't get on the tundra. We also, those of you who, who do sleep deprive yourself, you'll know that in fact at night, when you don't sleep well, the next morning you can't quite figure out whether you're getting a cold or not. And that's probably because of the inflammatory cytokines that rise when you're sleep deprived. So in fact, we must think about what goes on upstream. This is related, definitely, to this, but it's also related to everything else that we've created. So, take care of yourself. Time is the most important thing. Make the technology work for you. Know your appetite. Eat slowly and with others. Exercise. Walk as much as you can. Good for the planet. Good for you. And get some sleep. That's the most important thing of all. <laughs>